a few years ago, I went on a medical mission trip to Iquitos, Peru, deep in the Amazon, and we would set up a makeshift clinic uh, in one of the community centers there. People would line up to see us. The facilities were pretty rudimentary. Uh, here's an exam room, for example, but we did have pretty good light in the exam room, mainly because there was a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> Uh, and while some of us were out in the community delivering parasite medications or treating infections, others of us were back in the hospital doing surgery. And what amazed us all was how little pain medication these patients needed post-operatively. Uh, we were doing some, the, the surgeons were doing some complicated orthopedic procedures. And in the U.S., you get IV morphine for a day or two after these procedures. These guys were walking around the halls afterwards the next day on ibuprofen. And we'd ask the patient, what's going on? They'd say, well, heck, doc, you came all the way down here to fix my hip. I can already tell I'm going to be walking straighter. Now pain. That's when my Uncle Tito accidentally cut his arm off in the sugarcane field with a machete. We were a two-day canoe trip from Iquitos, the closest medical care. That was painful. This, nah, I can deal with this. And I started thinking, how can a procedure in one country that's perceived as super painful be treated in another country with Advil? And I saw this study where researchers went to different countries and they asked people, how often have you been in pain in the last six months? On the far left, we got the Czech Republic, where 8% of people said often or very often. On the far right, we have the United States, where 34% of people said, I've been in pain often or very often. Really? Does the human body experience pain differently depending on what country it's in? What's going on? You know, uh, uh, we spend more money treating chronic pain than we treat on, and then we spend on cancer, heart disease, diabetes, by far. Chronic pain has become an epidemic. These are people with migraines, other headache syndromes, chronic back pain, chronic neck pain, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, the list goes on and on. These people walk into my office every day. They've been to Mayo Clinic, they've seen dozens of doctors, they've had MRIs, CAT scans, injections, procedures, tubes in every orifice, and they still have pain. For 30 years, these people walked into my office, into my hospital, and I didn't know how to help. Uh, adding to my confusion at this time, I started reading and seeing some articles in the medical literature about the other thing that walks into my, uh, into my office day in and day out, and this is anxiety. I see this all the time. Here's an article from the New England Journal of Medicine. Something has gone wrong in contemporary academic and clinical psychiatry. Psychiatric diagnoses and medication proliferate under the banner of scientific medicine, but there's no comprehensive biologic understanding of psychiatric disorders. This is the New England Journal of Medicine saying there's no science behind psychiatry. Here's Dr. Tom Insel, the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health. I spent 13 years really pushing the neuroscience of genetics and genetics and mental disorders. Spent a lot of money, $20 billion, got some cool papers published. I don't think we moved the needle in reducing suicide, reducing hospitalization, improving recovery for the tens of millions of people with mental health problems. I don't think we moved the needle. If I'm not understanding pain correctly, and there's no scientific basis for mood disorders and anxiety, the other major health epidemic going on, what's the missing piece? The missing piece is neuroscience, the new neuroscience. About six years ago, I started reading about the new neuroscience of brains and pain, brains and mood disorders, and it's completely changed the way I practice medicine. The main reason we have a new neuroscience is because of an imaging technology called functional MRI. With fMRI, we can see real-time brain metabolism. So uh, I'm simplifying a bit, but the neuroscientists can put you in the machine. They say, think of what you had for breakfast. Oh uh, yeah, I see some neurons lighting up there. Okay, now think about the last argument you had with your husband. Whoa, those are some different neurons lighting up. So, We've stopped talking about chronic pain as a problem in the body because if your pain has lasted longer than three to six months, we see circuits in the brain, in the emotional and the learning centers of the brain that are completely unexplainable by body tissue damage. And we've stopped talking about anxiety as a chemical imbalance. One, because that theory has been completely disproven. And two, we can see the circuits. So the old neuroscience was that your body sent your brain a pain signal, 
The brain said, thank you very much for that pain signal. I'll go get my ibuprofen. The new neuroscience says, sure, the body sends signals to the brain, but it's the brain that decides. Is that signal dangerous? And if your brain decides the signal's dangerous, then the brain warns you by creating pain. So pain's a protective mechanism. If I'm running and I break my ankle, I want pain. That's how my brain protects the ankle. I don't want to not have pain, damage it further. So pain is the way my brain protects a broken ankle. I now see pain as nothing more than my brain's alarm mechanism to let me know I'm in danger, a potential danger. And if my brain thinks I'm in danger, then it activates certain neural circuits to create for me the experience of pain to get me out of that situation. Anxiety works the same way. If I'm in a dark alley at night, I'm running from a lion, I want anxiety, yes please. It's called the fight or flight response. I'll run faster. So we're starting to understand pain and anxiety as protective alarms from the brain to the body. Now, where's all this happening? How does this happen? What part of the brain is this happening? Well, it's important to understand there's something running you that isn't you. Let me introduce you to your autopilot, your inner autopilot. This is the top of the brain stem, the lower parts of your skull for the most part, is what I think of as the autopilot part of your brain, and it runs your entire body through a network of neurons called the autonomic nervous system, and it's primitive. Every animal on the planet has an autonomic nervous system. It evolved in reptiles hundreds of millions of years ago. Sometimes I call it your lizard brain, and uh, it's, it's controlling everything about you. It controls your hormones, your heart, your lungs, your bowel, your bladder, your inflammatory response, your immune system. These things don't just happen. There's a conductor, and it's in your brain. You just don't have direct control over it. I don't have direct control over mine, and I don't want direct control over mine because I don't know how to run my liver and my pancreas. <laughs> so for all these complicated things that it's doing moment to moment, millions of decisions to keep the body running, it has one purpose, and only one. Keep the body safe. Keep this organism alive. Same purpose in me as in the lizard. So a lot of times I think of it not just as my lizard brain, but I think of it as my lizard on the rock brain. <laughs> Am I okay? Do I need to duck under the rock? There's a part of your brain making that calculation every moment of your life. So with this different understanding that there's a part of your brain running you, you don't have control over, it's making decisions about your safety at all times, let me just show you a way of thinking about how your brain and your body are connected when stress comes in. Here up high, we have the brain. Down low, we've got the body. Stress comes in. I'm just talking about the stress of life, a phone call, waking up in the morning. And uh, the brain kind of goes, oh, we're under a little bit of stress, a little bit of threat. Well, okay, and it's primitive. It doesn't know the difference between physical threat, lion chasing you, versus existential threat your rent payment, your relationships. Lizards don't have relationships. They lay eggs and they run away. <laughs> this is a primitive part of the brain we're dealing with. So when it feels threat, it has one response. Well, let me protect you. And it sends some protective messages to the body. We've all had something like this called anxiety or fight or flight. Now, if that's just a brief thing like a door slamming, well, you'll calm back down. But if it's not a one-off, and what I mean by that is if the sensations themselves have caused problems for you in the past, the negative thoughts follow. What if I don't sleep tonight? I gotta get up in the morning. And the negative thoughts put more stress on the brain. I'm the primitive survival brain. Really, we're in more trouble? Let me protect you some more. And we get more tension in the body. That feels like crap and we get more negative thoughts. And pretty soon we're in this vicious cycle that I call the pain, fear, pain, fear, or the anxiety, fear cycle. We've got a, a brain that's afraid of its own alarm. Alarm comes in, brain says, uh-oh. What does a do, brain, brain do when it says, uh-oh? It sends more alarm to the body. So what's happening here is uh, uh, Judd Brewer is a uh, neuroscientist and psychiatrist at Brown University who talks about anxiety in terms of habit loops. This is a habit loop that the brain has gotten in, and brains are really good at forming habits. Whether it's riding a horse or hitting a tennis ball, if you do it every day, your brain wires neurons together and you get good at it. If you've been practicing pain or anxiety for months or years, your brain's wired the neurons together and it's really good at it. It's wired together 
a hypervigilant habit loop, a habit loop of overprotection. And this hypervigilance is not a disease. Once you understand that anxiety is not a medical disorder and chronic pain is not body tissue damage that in my body just won't heal, and instead you see it for what we now know it is, which is brain circ circuits, habit loops in your lizard brain, something fantastic happens. It helps you realize this isn't you. You don't want this. No part of you wants this. This is your primitive survival brain running some brain circuits that developed outside of your conscious awareness. And for anyone here who's dealing with anxiety or chronic medical problem that doctors can't figure out, what that means is this is not your fault. That's an important message that a lot of my patients aren't hearing from their family, from their friends, even from the medical establishment. But it's the message that the new neuroscience of brain circuitry is showing us. This is not your fault. There is something you can do about it, though. Traditionally, if we think we got some brain circuits that are out of whack, let's go to the psychotherapist, see if you can figure this out. The problem is these circuits aren't happening in the thinking part of the brain, or you would have thought your way out of it yesterday. They're happening in lizard brain, and you can't psychoanalyze a lizard. So in mind-body medicine, we step away from psychoanalysis. We step away from the story you've been telling yourself and while you're trying to figure yourself out. Or if you have pain, we step away from the story that you and your doctors have created about why your pain won't heal. And instead, we turn to the body because now we're in the language of the autonomic nervous system. And this part of the brain doesn't learn by reading books or watching lectures. It learns by experience and repetition. So, in, so instead of uh, running away from these problems, we teach people how to move towards the sensations and do something different with them instead of fear. We teach you how to teach your brain a new habit. In my clinic, in my mind-body clinic, we teach most of this in classes and groups. Uh, and that's another important part of mind-body medicine, the idea that we, we all live in community and that's part of our health. When we teach these tools and ideas of new brain circuitry and exercises to retrain the brain, experiential exercises to retrain the brain, when we do this in a class or a group, we're leveraging the healing power of community and connection. So we've got a big group here. I'd love to teach everybody here two simple tools that I like to teach everybody from the very beginning, just, just at the start. And, and remember, th these are just messages. We're gonna learn some exercises to help teach the brain some safety. And we're not gonna think our way to safety. We're not gonna talk our way to safety. When you tell yourself, I'm fine, everything's okay. Here's what your lizard brain hears. <laughs> it doesn't speak English. It speaks one language, body language, all day long, sends, receives messages to and from the body. So we're gonna do some body-based messages to give your brain most of moments or messages of safety. Uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. David Hanscom, I heard him once call these active mini meditations. Here's the first active mini meditation. You can join me if you like. Sit up in your chair and drop your shoulders. It looks like this. If you think, well, wait a minute, I'm not sure I did that. You can raise your shoulders to your ears and let them go. Here's the second active mini meditation. It's called one slow deep breath in and out through your nose. And again, you can join me if you like. I'm guessing that few of you said, hmm, I actually felt something. Maybe you want to do another one. Here's what's happening. If I'm about to be attacked, I'm like this, and I would never do this. When I do this, I just sent a message of safety to the brain because nobody sits like this under threat. When I do this, my crew brain down here is going, Hey guys, the captain of the ship just stepped in, has us doing slow nasal breathing. Everything must be fine. Because nobody slow nasal breathes under threat. So when we do these body-based messages of safety to the brain, we're activating the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve carries 75% of your parasympathetic nerve fibers. These are the relaxation nerve fibers part of the autonomic nervous system. And neurons that fire together, wire together. It's a nice rhyming phrase, comes from the neuroscientists. They see it happen. So if I fire some parasympathetic neurons with a shoulder drop, 
and I fire a few more. And I do this here and there throughout the day. My brain goes, geez, we keep firing parasympathetic neurons. I'm going to start wiring some of those together for you. You are literally building a stronger parasympathetic relaxing part of your nervous system, whether you want to or not. So you don't have to meditate for half an hour. You don't have to think happy thoughts and you don't have to go to Nirvana. Just do the damn exercises. <laughs> I once heard Stanford neuroscientist Andrew Huberman say, trying to control the mind with the mind is like trying to grab fog. If you want to control the mind, turn to the body. For two of our biggest health epidemics, Western medicine and modern psychiatry need to start embracing the new neuroscience, which is telling us that the mind and the body are connected in ways that aren't always best treated with blocking a chemical receptor or injecting a medication. We're discovering you don't always need a doctor to change your symptoms. We're learning that you can change your own brain circuits, and we're discovering the tools to help you take charge of your own health. This is the new neuroscience. Let's use it. Thank you. Thank you.